Hi, and welcome to this talk. My name is Dr. Petra Baron, and I'm one of the doctors at Biokrebs in Heidelberg, which is a non-profit, independent organization providing advice and information to cancer patients. And I'm very excited that in today's interview, I have a chance to speak with Dr. Kelly Turner. Most of you probably already know her New York Times bestsellers, Radical Remission and the new one, Radical Hope, that have been translated in, correct me, Kelly, but I think it was 22 languages. Yes. And of course, they have spread hope and a little more understanding into what um, people do to heal against all odds, as you sometimes put it. Over the past 15 years, Dr. Turner has conducted research all around the globe and has analyzed over 1,500 cases of remission. But let's get started. A very warm welcome, Kelly. The Thank first you. question that comes to mind if we talk about radical remission is, what is that? What is a radical remission? Well, first of all, thanks for having me on your, your interview here today, Petra. I'm so excited to be talking to an organization like yours in Germany, because I think the fact that you guys are pr practicing integrative medicine and integrative oncology over there um, is just very inspiring. You know, in some ways, Germany has led the way in terms of anthroposophic medicine and homeopathy and um, just wonderful use of integrative methods along with conventional medicine. So um, I'm thrilled to be to be talking to someone in Germany who's really at the forefront of integrative care, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, but a great first question, what is a radical remission? Many doctors have referred to it for the past 100 years as spontaneous remission. So some people, some of your listeners may be familiar with that term. But when I started conducting my research 15 years ago and actually talked to the spontaneous remission survivors, I quickly realized there was nothing spontaneous at all about their recoveries. They weren't quick. They weren't miraculous. They didn't come from one you know, dream overnight from God. Um, radical remission survivors typically on average take a year and a half to go from stage three or four cancer to a place of stability, a place of remission. And so, and they're also absolutely changing 10 big aspects of their lives. And we'll get to those 10 factors later. So there's nothing spontaneous about how they heal. It's hard work and um, willingness to completely transform your life over the course of at least a year and a half. So I call it radical remission, but it's, it's essentially someone who heals from a uh, cancer diagnosis or from another illness in a statistically unlikely way. So they're, they're healing in a way that their doctors statistically don't expect them to. Often um, for me, that comes in three categories. Someone who uh, category one is someone who's diagnosed with cancer or another illness, tries conventional medicine to its fullest, but it doesn't work. So they're basically sent home on hospice care to die. At that point, after trying conventional medicine, they are forced to switch to other methods and then they heal. So that's a statistically unlikely remission. That's category one. Category two are people who are diagnosed. So they have an official diagnosis. It's not a misdiagnosis. And they make the personal decision, again, I'm not advocating this, this is just the people I study, the personal decision to forego or postpone conventional treatment, at least for a period of time, while they first try working on other avenues for health, right? Integrative methods, alternative methods. And for this category of people that I study, making that choice to postpone conventional treatment in lieu of the alternative methods does work for them. So they end up never needing the conventional treatment because they bring themselves into remission. Again, statistically unlikely for that to happen, according to our medical statistics. And then the third category are people who have a statistically unlikely remission when they combine conventional and alternative methods at the same time. Now, when you combine them at the same time, it's very difficult to know which one is working, mm -hmm. which one worked, which one helped. Was it both? Was it just one? But for me, if, um, if someone is recovering from a, a cancer diagnosis or really any illness, that has a less than 25% five-year survival rate, it really doesn't matter how they're doing it. The fact that they're alive five years later is statistically unlikely. So they are still worthy of study. Um, so this third category would be, for example, someone with stage four lung cancer who uses um, chemotherapy along with alternative methods to come to a place of full remission. That is statistically unlikely. And so those are people that I also study. So in a nutshell, a radical remission is a statistically unlikely remission. 
um, that happens uh, usually after conventional medicine has done all that it can. Against all odds. As you against all out. odds. Yes, <laughs> healing against all odds. Yes. So what, what brought you to it? What, what brought you into that field of research and to look into remissions that usually are just, we have case reports, everybody knows that, but it's generally considered um, unlikely and not worth researching. What brought you to it? Well, personal reasons. I mean, I think most people in this world now have been touched by cancer in some way. For me, it was something that in fact affected me at a very young age because the first two deaths that I experienced as a child were due to cancer. Um, my uncle died when I was eight years old and you know, I was close with my cousin and suddenly she had no daddy, right? So I was like, whoa, cancer is this thing that can just snatch your daddy away and make him die. So that was very frightening for me as a child. And then when I was 14 years old, um, my, my friend was diagnosed with stomach cancer at the age of 14. So, you know, true childhood cancer. And he tried everything that conventional medicine had to offer, surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation. It didn't work. And he passed away when we were both 16. So I think those two formative experiences, um, I'm certain had much to do with the direction that I took after my undergraduate degree at Harvard. Um, I was, I was looking for something meaningful. I was, I've always been drawn to incredible stories, um, especially true stories. And I, I wasn't quite sure what to do, you know, in your early twenties after college, you're trying to find your way. And I ended up volunteering, at, I, was, I was working on a book on actually climate change. And then in my spare time, I was volunteering at a cancer hospital and I just loved helping these little children who had cancer. I loved bringing a smile to their face. So anyway, that led me to get my master's in counseling, uh, specifically counseling cancer patients. And I did that at the University of California, Berkeley. And that was gonna be it. I was gonna be a counselor. I was gonna help cancer patients for the rest of my life. Um, but I came across a case of spontaneous remission and I read about it in a book and I was so floored that this man that I was reading about was sent home on hospice care with stage four kidney cancer and then completely on his own with his own changes, got into remission and walked into his doctor's office three years later and they scanned him and he had no evidence of cancer. This man is Shin Teriyama. He is the reason I'm here today. Um, actually, I need to thank Andrew Weil, who wrote about, uh, Dr. Andrew Weil, who wrote about Shin Teriyama's case in, in Dr. Weil's famous book, Spontaneous Healing, because the, the day I read that book was the day everything changed. I, I ran home from the, my counseling job and I searched online to see if I could find this man, if I could find his case or his name. And instead, I found over a thousand, 1,000 cases of spontaneous remission in peer-reviewed medical journals for the past 100 years. And I just was floored. I said, what? We are sitting on a gold mine of a thousand people who've turned around their cancer. And I'm sorry that the doctors don't know why these people healed, but I would love to find out. Um, so anyway, I went, I went back for my PhD at UC Berkeley specifically to study these 1000 cases that no one was studying. And then here we are. <laughs> Well, yeah, it's, it is amazing. Like these cases are amazing for everyone, not only for, for someone who's just undergoing cancer treatment or has just had the diagnosis. And what amazed me when I um, went out of normal hospital medicine and started working for our um, organization, that there is so many cases, like there's more than the thousand you find in publications. On our oh. website, we have documented a few and they are just there. And they are not as rare as we are made to believe. And yeah, it's about time that we started researching it properly. <laughs> so well Absolutely. done. Thanks again. Yes. The, and I'm so glad you brought that up because yeah. that was another thing. My professors were a little concerned that I wouldn't be able to find enough of these yeah. cases to research. Because if you just go by the fact that there's a thousand case reports, you know, at this point, there's probably 1200 since the year 1900 when medical journals really came about. Yeah. Um, it's not that many, right? Millions of people are diagnosed with cancer every single year. So to have a thousand is really a very rare phenomenon. But as you so wisely pointed out, and as I quickly discovered in my research, the vast majority of radical remission cases are going unpublished in medical journals. And the reason why is because the only way to get something published in a medical journal is if your doctor volunteers her or his time 
to write up the case report, which takes on average, you know, 20 hours of unpaid work, and then sends it into a journal, which costs a fee, usually around $100, and then is likely to get rejected because they have to admit at the end of that case report, I have no hypothesis. I have no idea how this person got well. So these aren't cases that journals are usually like looking to publish because there's no answer at the end of it. And doctors don't always have 20 hours of volunteer time and a hundred extra dollars that they're willing to give to something that they feel they had nothing to do with. So we really need a better system for tracking these cases. Um, you know, my estimate is that for every case that goes published, there's a hundred more that go unpublished. I mean, that's the level of, un of underreporting that we're dealing with. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I believe that. So how did your peers, how did your fellow researchers um, recept you or, or, you know, how did they feel about you working with radical emissions or spontaneous emissions? What was the reception of your the, the reception from oncologists and from the medical field has been very positive, but very quiet. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was sort of expecting pitchforks and instead I got, um, you know, letters of thanks. But I didn't get I didn't get many, um, and I think what's been interesting with the success of the, of my books and the docu series is that it's really seeming to be a ground up movement. It's reaching the patients, and then they're bringing the book to the doc to their doctors, and then sometimes those doctors reach out to me, and I'm fine with that. I'm happy to have it be you know a movement from from the ground up because really to go from the top down requires um, millions of dollars of funding and clinical trials that take five years. I mean, we're working on a pilot study right now with Harvard University, and it's taken us three and a half years just to do a very small pilot study. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you know, that. <laughs> scientific research moves very, very, very slowly. Mm -hmm. And the doctors, it then has to go from the research, it has to be replicated, which takes another 10 years. Then that needs to somehow get um, translated to the medical schools where it's being taught. And then you're only teaching the new doctors, but the old doctors still don't know it. So changing medicine is slow and it's a long, long road, um, which is why I'm actually fine that um, my work has reached the patients uh, en masse because those are the ones. The who, yeah, they're the ones who need the help right now. Yeah. And as I understand, you've, um, after talking to so many um, people who gone the journey, as I understand, you were able to factor out or point out a few factors that they had in common. But I imagine that would have been difficult <laughs> from, you know, when we counsel patients and we see the patients who do really well, even outside of, of normal medicine or after, as you said, medicine has failed. Um, it's very hard to point at one thing that helps everybody. So you've had how many factors initially? What was the, you know, in your book, you're stating nine or in the second book, 10 factors. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I imagine that it was hard to come by these factors. It was, but you know, that's where, you know, research methods really help. Um, mm -hmm. it, at UC Berkeley, I was trained in both what, what are called quantitative and qualitative research methods. And mm -hmm. as, a, as a researcher, you have to apply the research method um, according to the situation that you're studying, right? You have to choose the right method for what you're trying to accomplish. And when we were looking at the phenomenon of spontaneous remission, what I've come to call radical remission, the issue was a lack of hypotheses, right? So we had thousands of case reports, but no hypotheses, very few hypotheses for why these people were getting well. And if there were hypotheses, it had to do with somehow this person is stimulating their immune system. Well, that didn't give us, you know, much helpful info. So when I sat down with my professors to talk about what kind of research methods would be most appropriate to try to answer the research question, which is why are these people getting well? How and why are they getting well? When you don't have an, a hypothesis to test, you have to use anthropological research methods or qualitative research methods in order to generate hypotheses. So the whole purpose of my original research was to generate hypotheses for why these people were getting well. And the best uh, research method to do to generate a hypothesis is anthropological research methods. So I was acting more like an anthropologist. So I was going to find these people in their homes, in their native countries. I traveled around the world for a year, thanks to the American Cancer Society. I will always be grateful for that amazing grant. And 
I, I didn't go in with a set of questions. I didn't say, did you change your diet? Did you exercise? Did you take any supplements? Um, when you're doing these anthropological methods, you actually have to go in with as few questions as possible. And you're really trying to observe. Mm -hmm. So my one, my one and only question was tell me everything you did to help yourself get well. And there's nothing too crazy. So tell me everything you did to heal yourself. Um, and then I let them talk and then I would use my counseling skills to get them to open up and talk a bit more. And, you know, it was interesting. They always started with things that they thought that I would be okay with like diet and exercise or supplements. And then, you know, they'd move on to maybe something related to stress reduction. And then at some point in the interview, they'd always sort of give me this look and be like, and I would say, well, anything else, you know, there's nothing too crazy, like anything. And then they would look at me and say, well, do you really want to hear something a little crazy? <laughs> and then they would start opening up and telling me, you know, their deepest intuitions about, you know, a powerful moment in their healing journey. And that was, that was really special because I got to bring, you know, both my research training and my counseling training in to do this research. And you're absolutely right. They did a lot more than these 10 common factors. I mean, these interviews often lasted three hours and I would, at the end of an interview have, you know, often 50 or 50 or more things that this person just told me they did to heal. And then you do, you know, interview after interview after interview. And after you've done a hundred of these interviews, you've got a huge list. I mean, I had a list of, you know, really, I mean, I could, the list could have been very long, but when I, when I put things into categories, I had a list of over 85 different things mm -hmm. that radical mission survivors had done to get well. And what I really had to do was zoom out and say, okay, they're all eating different things. They're all, some of them are eating paleo. Some of them are eating ketogenic. Some of them are vegan. Some of them are raw. Some of them are fruit only. Some of them are no fruit. Um, so the diet was particularly challenging because it was very hard to see common threads. But if I really zoomed out, I said, well, they're all changing their diet. So that's interesting. They are all changing what they eat. So they're ch from whatever they were eating before, which was allowing this cancer state to be present in their body they've changed it. So they've done a change. Um, and if I really zoomed out from the diet, I could see, okay, they're all eating more vegetables. They're all eating more vegetables. That is a common thread. And, you know, in sort of broad strokes, they are reducing meat, wheat, sweets, and dairy, right? Meat, gluten, refined sugars, and dairy. So when it came to boiling down all of these interviews and all the different things people had done, I just really had to zoom out and I had to get very general in my description. So for example, some people did psychotherapy, some people did Reiki energy healing. But if I zoomed out, when they explained the results of those techniques, they said, it allowed me to let go of the grief I was holding onto, or it allowed me to let go of the anger or the fear. And so one of my 10 key factors for radical remission survivors is releasing suppressed emotions. And again, I had to get super general because they were all releasing different emotions. Some of them grief, trauma, fear, stress, right? And then they were all releasing it through different techniques. So some people psychotherapy worked really well for some people, um, like I said, Reiki or an energy work um, was what worked for them. So everyone found the technique that worked best for them to release whatever emotion they were holding on to. So, so yeah, I would say my research was very much a deep dive into anthropology and then a big zoom out so that I could take these thousands of pages of interview transcripts and try to come up with something that looked like what they were all doing. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that because that's a challenge we face in our counseling, of course, too. You know, people call and many, not all, but many would love uh, a certain, you do this and step two is that. And if you change your diet to exactly this and you take these supplements, then it's all gonna be fine. But that doesn't work because as you found out too, it's an individual journey. We all come from a different starting point. We have a different background. We have different cultures. And you've talked with, with Ivelisse in a podcast I listened to preparing to that interview, Ivelisse Page, um, some of you might know from our convention um, 2019. She was a stage four bowel cancer survivor who spoke there and inspired quite a lot of people. You spoke with her about intuition, which was a key factor too, I think, in, in your findings and which helped her go her own way. 
And that's something we we often point out in our um, yeah in our counseling that the healer is in there. We might need help from the outside, different things, but in the end, we need to take charge of the help of, of our help. Was that what you found when you spoke to cancer survivors? Absolutely, yes. Um, mm -hmm. Two of the 10 key healing factors that have emerged from the data in my research are related to what you're talking about. The first one is following your intuition. And the second one is empowering yourself. So I'll talk about each one briefly. Following your intuition is something that radical remission survivors do. Again, I'm not a medical doctor, so none of this is medical advice. I'm not telling people what to do. I'm just simply a researcher reporting on what this group of people have done. And this group of people, these radical remission survivors, one of the things they have in common, which completely shocked me because I was not expecting it to come up in every single interview, is following your intuition. Mm -hmm. It's not, that's not something that um, most people in the United States, and I can speak for the United States because that's where I'm from. So I don't want to speak for other countries, but in the United States culture, when you're sick, you don't go to the doctor and the doctor doesn't typically does not say, well, what is your intuition telling you about this? <laughs> we are not, we are not encouraged to tap into some sort of inner wisdom. We're literally just supposed to, you know, listen to the doctor, look at the test results and take the medicine they give us. And so there's a very passive relationship between patient and doctor, at least here in the United States, I can speak for that. And what I noticed about radical remission survivors is that they were doing two things. Things. They were shifting from being that classic passive patient who just nods and says, yes, doctor, okay. And they were moving from that place of passivity to a place of empowerment. And they were starting to say, I, wanna, I want to lead this health journey, this healing journey. I want to be in charge here. I will listen to the doctor. I will listen to my friends and family. I will listen to my you know, acupuncturist, psychotherapist, but I'm in the center. I'm, I'm, I'm the captain of this ship. And that movement from being completely passive to being empowered and being a decision maker is something that came up in every single interview that I did. And kind of along with that, or I guess part of that is this other factor of listening to hearing for the first time for many of them, and then uh, listening to your intuition. And the way that radical mission survivors describe that is often having a very strong gut feeling. So they'll feel it in their stomachs and it might be a feeling of dread or it might be a feeling of worry. Usually when they talk about their gut feelings, it's talking to them in fear. Um, and then they would also say they would hear voices. And, you know, after a while, I'm like, am I just interviewing a bunch of, you know, mentally ill people? <laughs> like what's happening? But when they described the voice, it was a very rational, sane voice. Um, that they often described as their inner voice or their wisest self, or sometimes their soul, or sometimes God, you know, they had different names for it, but they would hear a calm, soothing voice that would tell them something that would make them feel safer. And again, these, this came up in every interview. So I had to write it down and I had to report it back to my professors, which was very embarrassing. But then I dove into the research behind intuition and it became a lot less embarrassing for me because the intuition, the research behind intuition is absolutely fascinating and statistically impressive. And what it basically tells us is that we have a second brain in our gut. We have hundred million neurons lining the 18 feet of our intestines, and they talk almost instantaneously to our brain. And their purpose is to um, not only communicate with the brain, but also warn us of danger, right? So we have butterflies in our stomach, or we have strong gut feelings of fear from these neurons, right? The exact same brain cells that are in your brain are in your gut. And they talk to us when we are feeling endangered. And of course, as you know, hearing the words, you have cancer, makes most people in this, on this planet feel endangered. They feel like their life is in danger. So it makes sense that th these neurons in our gut start quote unquote talking to us through these strong feelings when we get that kind of cancer diagnosis. Now, we also have um, a back part of our brain, right above the cerebellum. Um, sorry, the cerebellum, it's right above the top of your spine. It's also called the reptilian brain. It's the oldest part of the human brain, and it is responsible for survival. So that is the part of your brain that talks to you through this voice. 
right? So the frontal cortex is where we make to-do lists and shopping lists, and we start worrying and planning and being rational and, you know, making budgets. That's all in the front part of your brain. But when our lives are threatened, such as through a cancer diagnosis, the blood leaves the frontal cortex and goes back to the back part of the brain, the reptilian brain. And that part of your brain acts on instincts. It acts very quickly. It gives you instant instruction. It doesn't tell you why, it just tells you to act. And it often, uh, the way that radical remission survivors describe it is it's, it's a voice that's talking to them. And it is a voice, it's your brain. It's the survival part of your brain talking to you. So anatomically, we know where these voices are coming from and we know where these gut feelings are coming from. And then from a research standpoint, we know from you know, many studies that have been done at this point, but of course the famous one was the Iowa card study, the Iowa gambling task, where they hooked people up to different sensors and they had them look at these two decks of cards. One was unbeknownst to the person uh, filled with big wins and then big losses. And the other one was filled with slow and steady wins. Well, the people's bodies, their hands and their heart, because they were measuring their heart rate variability and their, their sweat glands, the bodies knew after 10 cards, which was the safe deck and which was the dangerous deck. Their frontal cortex, the part of the, their, their brain that thinks and understands things didn't know until 80 cards. Okay, so what does that teach us? And, and this study has been replicated and many, many other studies have been done that show us similarly that the body knows the paths to safety and danger long before the thinking part of our brain, the rational frontal cortex can even figure out what's going on. So yeah. that's why it makes a little more sense and it feels a little safer to be able to report to you that radical remission survivors follow their intuition. They're not just, you know, following a horoscope they read in a paper that day. They're listening to their own bodies, which science has shown us knows the path to safety and the avenues that lead you towards danger long before the thinking part of our brain even knows what's happening. So, um, so yeah, intuition is is uh it's one of the common factors among radical remission survivors take it or leave it that's what the data shows us yeah absolutely i believe that at once um but as you just pointed out when you said it was almost embarrassing reporting that back to your professors it's something we don't like to trust because we are so focused on on our brain these days also yeah it works the other way around too and i guess that's some of the other factors as well and we have the research into that as well into now let me see if i can get the word right in english psycho neuro immunology immuno, in, it's a it's a tough word it's, it, even for english speakers it's hard to pronounce psycho neuro immunology <laughs> immunology exactly on that word i often struggle in English but in German it's okay but we mean the same thing so we know that the other way around when we follow our feelings or if we have positive feelings that that immediately works on our immune system and um, supports our body in having the right um, balance and going towards healing but still this too is is almost a bit yeah get less stress and that's all. What was your experience there? What did people do? What, what are the other factors? Basically? Well, so of the 10 factors, only three are physical. Um, they're probably what Amazing. you would guess. Yeah, they would, you probably guess what they are, but it's changing your diet, taking herbs yep. and supplements like vitamins, yep. and then uh, exercise or moving your body. And then the other seven are mental, emotional, spiritual, which is sort of mind blowing. But as you and I both know, there's so much research that shows that the, your thoughts lead to your emotions and your emotions lead to your hormo hormonal state and your, your hormonal state absolutely right. dictates what your immune system should or should not be doing. So it's really, it's really a cause and effect chain that leads right to your immune system. So your thoughts lead to your emotional state, leads to your her her hormonal blood status, which leads to your immune activation. So, and this is not something I've made up or discovered. This is absolutely discovered by science 60 years ago. Um, Psychoneuroimmunology. Find out. Go, go ahead. Yep. No, I was just going to say we can find out and feel it right away. We just need to imagine you bite in a lemon, and immediately your your body reacts. You have um, saliva there. So there is a definite connection between our thoughts and what the body does and via the hormonal system is definitely there. Yeah, exactly. Sorry, I didn't... 
It, it, but that's exactly right. If you do, if you sit and you, you know, for five minutes, imagine taking out a lemon and cutting it and then slicing it and seeing the juice, right. you imagine picking it up and biting into it just through your imagination, your body will respond. And that's because we have a thought and a, a memory really about lemons. Yeah. And, you know, when, when it comes to the connection between hormones and then our blood chemistry, it becomes even more impressive, right? Because most people know about the fight or flight response and the rest and repair response. So you're in one or the other, you're either in fight or flight. So you're processing through cortisol and epinephrine and norepinephrine, or you're in rest and repair. So your body's processing things like relaxin and serotonin and endorphins and dopamine. And that second category that I just listed, those healing hormones, they activate your immune system. They, for example, lead to an increased number of natural killer cells, natural killer cells. I don't like that term. Uh, my my uh, radical remission survivor friend, Shin Teriyama calls them natural hugging cells. And I like that better because their job is to go around and find cancer cells and basically squeeze them until they pop, until they die. But our bodies have these, these NK cells. And when you flood your system with the healing hormones of you know, oxytocin, relax and serotonin, dopamine, et cetera, you are, our studies have shown that if you flood your body, your bloodstream with those hormones, it will lead to a significant increase in the number and activity level of white blood cells and natural killer cells. And those are the two things your body needs to go around and look for and remove cancer cells. So there is an absolute scientific direct connection between our thoughts and emotions and our natural killer cells, which are the, the cells that go around and kill cancer cells. So it, it shouldn't surprise us that seven of the 10 common healing factors are mental, emotional, spiritual. Um, but back to the seven. So uh, in no particular order, they are having strong reasons for living, increasing your social support, empowering yourself, like we talked about earlier, um, following your intuition, as we talked about, increasing your spiritual connection practice, whatever that is, we can talk about that if you want. And then the last two are increasing positive emotions and releasing suppressed emotions. And I'll just say, you know, I talked to one oncologist who read my book and he said, you know, okay, diet, herbs, exercise, I would have just called all the rest of those, the other seven, stress reduction. And I said, okay, I hear you. I hear you, but I'm a counselor. And there are so many nuances to our emotions, you know, and the, what we're doing when we're, we're releasing trauma is very different than we're jump, when we're jumping on a trampoline with our children, right? One is releasing a suppressed emotion that's been held in the body perhaps for decades. The other is having five minutes of just pure joy with children and laughter. And yes, I'm sure they both re reduce stress, but they're really powerful in their own unique ways. And you wouldn't you wouldn't say, you know, there's one way to reduce stress and it's, you know, over here jumping on a trampoline or there's one way to reduce stress and it's over here releasing your trauma. I think it's, I think it's incorrect to call all seven of those simply stress reduction. I think it, it also makes the roadmap to healing a lot more opaque, right? Because if you just yeah. tell your, your patients, oh, okay, now reduce your stress. They're like, but how, where, where do I begin? And what I love about what radical remission survivors have taught me is that there are seven avenues for, you know, quote unquote, reducing stress, but also for, in a very nuanced way, um, freeing up your emotional and spiritual energy so that it can become a healing force in your bloodstream. I mean, that's what we're talking about, really. We're, we're harnessing our thoughts and emotions. We have, what did I hear the other day? You have over 50,000 thoughts a day. Well, 50,000 of those could, could put you towards the healing response, right? The rest and repair response, or 50,000 of those could put you towards the cortisol response, the, the fight or flight response where you're not healing. So to simply ignore those 50,000 thoughts a day, which lead to emotions, which lead to hormones, which lead to immune activation, to simply ignore them is like, it's like ignoring a treasure trove, right? There's so much power in, in how we spend our days. There's so much power over our blood chemistry. So uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm not, I'm not one to oversimplify. Uh, ten, ten, 10 is a lot, but that's, that, that's what it was. 
<laughs> yeah, and I imagine you had a lot more factors to start off with. And I think it's a very important point. Yeah, we often talk, even us in our counseling, we, we speak about, yeah, you need to reduce stress. But it's exactly as you said, there are so many reasons to have stress in your body, in your uh, soul, in your mind, that you need to uh, yeah, start somewhere and, and focus on the different ways to release that stress. And it, as you said, it can be very, very different. And again, probably it's very individual too. Absolutely. My question now is, all these 10 factors, is that something they all did? Or is it what most of them did? Or is that the 10 common factors? That so these are the 10 common factors that everyone that I've studied okay. in depth has mm -hmm. done. Now, again, they're doing more than 10. Anyone yeah. that I've studied is doing like 40 or 50 things to get well. But what are they all doing? They're all doing these 10. Yeah. And um, one thing I'd love to bring up is the difference between my first and second book. So my first book, uh, which was based on my dissertation, mm -hmm. there were nine key healing factors and exercise was not one of them, which was very surprising to me in my original research. Now exercise came up a lot. It was always number, number 10 on the list of rankings, right? Um, but it wasn't in every interview. And so it didn't, it didn't merit being in the, in the findings, right? So I published my dissertation or I wrote my dissertation and then published my first book with these nine factors. And then because of the you know, unexpected success of my first book, cases started flooding in on my website, right? And, and we, we try to make it very easy at radicalremission.com. A person who's had a radical remission can tell us their story in 10 minutes or less. And that's because we shouldn't need to rely on doctors spending 20 hours of volunteer time. It should be quick. It should be easy. Just tell us, and then we'll follow up with you if we need to. So cases started flooding in. And again, as a researcher, I left it open. I said, is there anything else you did besides these nine factors? And all of the cases that came in from 2014 on when my first book was published included exercise or movement to the extent that it made me pause and be like, I think I need to go back and reanalyze my data here because maybe I missed something. So I called up a bunch of the people that I had interviewed originally. And I said, you know, in our three hour interview, you, in your opinion, exercise did not play a part in your healing. I just want to double check, you know, is that accurate? And they're like, yep, Absolutely. I could not go back to my aerobics class for at least a year. So that whole first year I was, no, I was not exercising. And I'm like, okay, all right. And they said, yeah, you know, back then all I could do was walk around the block. And then I said, oh, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. So you weren't going to your hour long spin class on the bike, like swipping, sweating, dripping buckets, but you were walking around the block because you had stage four cancer. And they're like, yep. And I said, but did you walk around the block every day? And they said, yes. Oh yes. Every day. I never missed it. And it, if I could walk around two blocks, I did. And that's when I realized um, that as a culture, we have this idea that exercise equals running or sweating, right? Something really yeah. vigorous. But when you're sent home in a wheelchair on stage with stage four cancer on hospice care, and your doctor says you're going to die in three months, you're not going to an aerobics class. The most you can do is maybe walk to the mailbox and back. And radical mission survivors were doing that. And so I called all the original people to double check and say, you know, were you doing movement? Were you doing the most movement that your body could handle, even if it was just a gentle walk to the mailbox? And they all said yes. And that's the main reason why I wrote the second book is because I wanted to let people know, you know, this was sort of a hidden factor that because of semantics really hadn't come up in my initial round of research. So that's the explanation for, for why it went from nine to 10 factors. Yeah, no, I'm, Kelly, I love talking to you because it's almost as if in, in our recommendations, we've used your book as a, you know, as a um, example and set up the counseling on that. But that can't be true because the organization exists for 40 years this year. We have our jubilee this year. But it's the same things that have crystallized out counseling cancer patients over all this, these years. And yeah, it is these simple things that people can do by themselves. And it's so empowering listening and, and hearing about your research, empowering for me as a counselor, but definitely surely for a patient out there or a, a person who has cancer. I don't like the word patient because that in itself has, um, when we translate it, if we look at the meaning of the word patient, it means 
um, help me out here with the English word to endure or to be passive. To be passive, yeah. Yeah. So that's exactly. what we want by the looks of it. Yeah, so, well, you, you bring up a great point, which is your clinic has been doing these 10 factors for 40 years with excellent results. And I definitely want to emphasize that point that I didn't, I didn't come up with these 10 factors. These are not Dr. Kelly Turner's 10 healing factors. Yeah. These are the healing factors that radical remission survivors discovered on their own. And, you know, I'm interviewing some yeah. of these people. I, I interviewed them in 2008, and I was talking to them about something that they had healed 35 years before then. So these are, these are 10 lifestyle changes that anyone can make. Most of them are free with the exception of herbs and supplements. And you can do it on your own, safely at home. Most doctors have no problem with nine out of 10 of them. The only one they have an issue with is herbs and supplements, understandably. And that's, that is the one healing factor that one costs money and two should not be done on your own. It should always be done in consultation with, you know, your your qualified herbalist who's hopefully in in conversation with your your you know western doctor yeah. um but yeah these are not my 10 factors these are the 10 factors that radical remission yeah. survivors discovered and i love getting emails from people who find my book and they say i healed from stage four cancer 40 years yeah. ago and reading your book was like reading my diary and i'm like great that means the research is accurate but absolutely these are tr tried and tested lifestyle changes that overhaul your immune system you know, someone, someone asked me the other day, well, what are these 10 factors? What are they really doing? How are they fighting cancer? And I said, well, it's like do-it-yourself immunotherapy, really. Mm -hmm. Immunotherapy is a wonderful advancement in cancer treatment. I am so excited to be following the advances of immunotherapy. And I think it's going to lead to, you know, the, the management of cancer as a chronic disease eventually. But when I look at what radical remission survivors are doing, they are doing their own immunotherapy but they're doing it in a DIY, do it yourself way, which takes longer and more effort and it's slower, but it leads to lasting results because these become 10 lifestyle changes that they do forever. You know, and I'm not saying people are on a really strict diet forever. Most radical mission survivors do a very strict diet, whatever that diet is for them for about two years. And then they, they ease off of it and they, they'll bring in some red wine and then, and they'll bring in some cheese occasionally. Um, you know, always in, in moderation, but um, the real intensity of the herbs and the diet seems to be something they do for on average two years, and then they can uh, relax it a little bit. But the, all the other seven mental, emotional, spiritual changes, they do those for life. And they do the, ex the exercise movement for life. And they do the healthy vegetable rich diet for life. And many of them take supplements as needed for life. Because they feel that it helps them. Yeah. I often try and turn it around, turn the focus around. Instead of fighting cancer, we're going for health, for being healthy, for a healthy living. And that changes the attitude as well, because you're doing something for yourself and not against something that you don't want. And yeah, are there any um, surviving survivor stories that you have in your mind that stuck with you or that impressed you especially? Oh, I have so many because I've, I've been blessed to, to be speaking to these incredible people for 15 years now. So I have so many. Um, one that I was thinking of this morning, he came to my mind, is a gentleman named Yokanan, who is featured in the docuseries that I did. So the docuseries, which you can find a, a link to on our website, RadicalRemission.com. It's a 10 episode docuseries taking people through the 10 healing factors. And in each episode, we feature two uh, radical remission survivors. So in, in episode three, which is the episode on releasing suppressed emotions, we feature two wonderful gentlemen, uh, Joe and Yokanan. And actually, I'll tell you both of their, their stories because they're they're both incredible. But, but Yokanan is, uh, is a wonderful, wonderful soul who was diagnosed um, in his early 40s with multiple myeloma, which is a blood cancer that is, you know, almost universally fatal, usually within three years. For him, he was given three months to live. They caught it at such a late stage. He was almost in kidney failure. Um, he tried chemotherapy for a day, it nearly killed him. So they had to take him off of it. Uh, his body was just so incredibly sick with the, with the multiple myeloma that Western medicine didn't have anything to offer him really. Uh, uh, as I said, he couldn't tolerate the chemotherapy. So 
instead of giving up, he actually had been a trained herbalist and was um, very much into herbs. And so he, he realized he hadn't, you know, been focusing enough on his own health. He'd been, you know, stressed with work and life and the demands of everything. So he made his own herbal concoction. He, he knew with the kidneys and the myeloma where things were off from an herbal standpoint. This is traditional Chinese medicine we're talking about. So he came up with his, you know, personalized own herbal formula. Sorry about that. He came up with his own personalized herbal formula. And then he did a GoFundMe because he didn't have lots of resources, but he asked his, so he reached out, he increased his social support, asked for help from friends and family to see if they would fund him to go to a clinic like yours. Um, for him, it was a clinic in Mexico because that was closest for him. But, you know, similar to what I, I've known of your, what I, what, I, what I know of your clinic, Petra, is, is an integrative clinic where, oh, go ahead. I need to interrupt you here for a second. It's actually not a clinic. We don't treat, we only advise. Oh, okay. So we Thank you. Then put people onto other addresses or wherever they want to go, but it's just basically sorting out where can I start? Where can I look? What can I do for myself? And what is up? Because most people don't know, but we don't treat actually. Oh, okay. Thank you for correcting just me. Just to make okay. that clear. So it's, it's more of a consultancy or a coaching. Absolutely. Integrative yeah. consulting. Okay. I love that. Well, he ended up going to a clinic where he was treated uh, with some integrative methods. Um, which includes, you know, like dripped in supplements, that sort of thing, some energy work. And he also used the, um, I think he was there for three or four weeks. He used that as a personal retreat time to work on his emotional layers because his intuition was telling him that the trauma of his youth had contributed to this, this state of imbalance that he was now facing. So he was doing the physical things, the diet, the supplements through the IVs. Um, you know, he took, he was, he went there in a wheelchair, so he only walked as much as he could every day. And then he dove into these seven mental, emotional, spiritual factors while he was there. Because he had nothing else to do. He was, you know, away from home and away from the usual tasks of life. And so he did a deep dive into all seven of the mental, emotional, spiritual ones, but especially releasing suppressed emotions. This is a gentleman who had grown up on the gang-ridden streets of um, South LA, Los Angeles. Mm -hmm incredible violence he was exposed to. He lost many friends to gang violence. He was exposed personally to police brutality. He witnessed police brutality. So just a really rough childhood filled with trauma. And then interpersonally in his own nuclear family, his father had left their family at a very young age, leaving his mom a single mother and struggling. So he had a lot of anger. He had a lot of trauma, a lot of sadness. Um, that he had to work through. And he worked through it, um, you know, during those three weeks in Mexico, he listened to certain meditations and he read books and he talked to counselors and on the phone and was just really willing to go in there and see where am I wounded inside? Where am I sad? Where am I traumatized? Where am I angry at my dad? You know, and he worked on those three weeks of releasing those emotions that had been, you know, bottled up inside of him for more than 30 years at this point, and he was a 40 year old man. So um, he came back uh, and was feeling better. And then over the next six months, he continued a very gentle, easy diet. And he slowly felt himself sort of coming back to life. And here he is now, oh gosh, five years later. So he was given three months to live. Five years later, he has no evidence of disease, turned around multiple myeloma on his own, using these 10 healing factors, um, including, you know, some of the supplements were obviously very strong medicine that were given to him, but it's just an empowering story to know that someone who at, at a, a relatively young age, right around the age of 40, facing something so terminal can turn it around. It, it I, I just never cease to be amazed by that. So that's the story of Yoganon. And if you want to yeah. meet him and, and hear him, you know, tell his story in his own words, that's, that's in the docuseries. The docu-series, I've seen it, I've watched it in English. <laughs> oh, great. But of course, many of our listeners will be German speaking. Is there intention to have it translated or where can you access the English version? Because it's um, really, really powerful to see and hear these, these people talk themselves and tell It is, stories. it is. You know, everyone's like, well, why'd you do the docu-series? You'd already written the books. And I said, well, I have for 
15 years had the pleasure of sitting across from these people and hearing their stories in their own words. And trust me, there's nothing more powerful. Um, and I just wanted you all to get to meet them because I, I feel uh, you know, a little guilty that I've been the only one meeting these incredible souls. So I wanted to, I wanted to share them with the world. Um, we don't have plans at the moment to, you know, dub it into German, but um, there is closed captioning. So if you're, if you can read English, that might help. And, you know, what the moment we're trying to, right now it's on the Hay House website. So if, if you go to radicalmission.com, you'll be linked to it, but it's, you know, being streamed exclusively on um, hayhouse.com. And hopefully we can get it to a more global distribution at some point, you know, whether it's Amazon or Netflix or Hulu or something. And maybe they'll pay for the dub. Maybe they'll pay for the German dubbing. Let's hope. Yes. <laughs> like your books. Yeah. 22 languages that probably wasn't done in one day either. So bit by bit. Right. Bit by bit. You've already said it that you had the um, the luck to talk to these people in person. Has it changed your life? Has it had an impact on you as you live your life or as you understand? I mean, absolutely. You can't, you can't sit across from someone who was on death's door and turn it around fully on their own and not be moved and not be yeah. impacted. And for me at this point, you know, having done hundreds and hundreds of interviews, it, it never, I never get numb. It never gets boring. It never it's always incredible for me to listen to. So absolutely, it's, it's completely changed my life. I mean, I can't say I'm doing all 10 of these factors perfectly every day, not by a long shot, but at least I know that I should be doing them, you know, I sh or I should be focused on them. So, you know, when, when I get stressed and therefore my diet slips and I'm starting to eat a lot of fried foods and sugary foods and um, oh when I'm stressed and not sleeping and... I, I know I'm like, you know what? Nothing is worth this stress. So let's get to the bottom of the stress so that we can get back to movement, get back to diet, get back to, you know, sleep is not one of the 10 factors um, because pe the people that I interviewed didn't talk about it as something they did. They worked on, they talked about it as a wonderful outcome of the other 10 factors, mm -hmm. especially the seven emotional, mental, spiritual ones. So of course they were feel, they were sleeping better from exercise and they were sleeping better from cutting out the sugar and the alcohol and the salt and stuff. But mostly they talked about how, because when, when you're diagnosed with cancer, you then have this mental like guillotine around you all the time. You have cancer, you have cancer and you're worried about it all the time. So that actually impedes their sleep according to their interviews I've done with them more than anything. Um, and certainly in my life, I know that I, I don't sleep well when I'm stressed and worried about, you know, some project or something that's coming up. Yeah. So, um, so certainly I think the way it's changed my life is just, I know, I know I should be focused on these and I, and I notice when I'm not, uh, I'm certainly not a perfect human being in any sense of the word, but, um, but I, I now know when I'm off. I know when I'm off balance and I know I'm like, what you mean. Mm -hmm. And then I know what, I know what I need to do. And the question is, do I do it right? Do I go to these 10 factors? Do I make them a priority? And every time I make them a priority, um, I, it's just so rewarding, right? Life For, gets better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Life gets better. I just went through this really stressful fall where I was doing three big work projects at the same time. It was very poor planning on my part. And <laughs> it was a level of stress I hadn't experienced in a very long time. And I, you know, everything started to fall apart, my sleep, yeah. my body, my pain, my diet. And I've really, since all that stress ended around, around November, let's say 10th. So I've had a month here to just be like, okay, back to the 10 factors time to yeah. not practice what I preach. Cause I'm not a preacher, but to practice what the radical mission survivors have taught me, which is when things are really off balance, go back to these 10 factors and, and just even bringing meditation back into my life on a daily basis for the past yep. month and daily exercise and meditation were the two things that I put back in. Um, cause diet, it, it's easy for me to clean up. Cause it's just like, okay, stop eating the chocolate. Um, <laughs> but the exercise and meditation, they're easy to come off your list when you're really busy, right? Like somehow you always manage to put food in your mouth, but you don't always yeah. take the time to do a half hour yoga class or do a 20 minute meditation. And, 
oh my goodness, this past month of putting those two things, just those two things back into my life. I am like, I'm a new person. I feel so good. And it's, it's empowering. Amazing. It didn't cost anything. These yeah. are walks in the woods and sitting on my couch with my eyes yeah. closed. Like it didn't cost a thing. And the way I feel today compared to how, I won't even say the word, how horrible I felt <laughs> a month ago. It's just unbelievable that something, yeah. that those things that are free and that I just need to prioritize can transform my health and my happiness so profoundly. It's, it's just like, it's a no brainer. Yep. Definitely. So you basically have already said it, but to conclude for today, I, I could talk with you for hours, I think. But yeah, I same here, Petra. <laughs> come, come to an end slowly. Um, my last question usually is, is there anything you would like to um, leave with our listeners? Um, what, what would it be if it was just one short message to leave them? Well, one thing, one short message that radical mission survivors have taught me, because 10 things is a lot, but one short thing that they've taught me is that in order to heal, you need to always be willing to make another change. You need to always be willing to change something else in your life or about yourself. And that willingness to always make changes continuously, right? So you're, you're doing something, it's working well, and then it stops working. Okay, make a change. All right, now that's going well. Some things got better. Some things didn't make another change. Mm. That willingness to always change your life yeah. is inspiring to me. And it, it, it's, um, it's something that sticks with me when I think about all the amazing radical mission survivors I've met over these past 15 years. I'm like, wow, you were willing to change everything to get back to balance. And that's, that's brave. I think that's brave. It is. Thank you so much, Kelly, for this beautiful interview. And I think there was so much in it that, yeah, where you can start, where it's empowering and where we can all start looking at our lives and, and checking, as you just said, are we onto the factors or not? <laughs> and where it goes wrong, because it's amazing how they all interlace and it's like a big puddle and it all influences the other parts of our lives too and you don't need to have a cancer diagnosis to start working on them no you definitely thank do you not. thank you very much for your time kelly thank you for having me it was really nice to meet you petra and it was a joy to be on your podcast here thank you